right, welcome to the Special Purpose Operating System Working Group meeting. Uh, we are a CNCF Take Runtime uh, Working Group and follow the CNCF Code of Conduct. Uh, in the chat, I put the agenda doc. Uh, feel free to add your name as attendee if you wish to. Uh, do not need to if you do not want to. <laughs> and if you have anything else that you want to talk about, feel free to throw that on the agenda. Um, I had a couple of things I put on there. Uh, one is, first one, probably uh, meeting cadence. Um, you know, we, we worked through all of the different presentations for the different operating systems that are, have been involved so far. Um, so things have kind of slowed down a bit since then. Uh, so, uh, you know, right now we're, we're set to do the first and third Thursday of every month. Um, I wanted to pitch it out there what people would think about if we drop that down to just once a month, if we did the first Thursday of every month, um, at least until, you know, if there's more activity that warrants meeting more often than that. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah that makes I sense mean, to me. Go ahead, Mark. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I mean, if we don't have content, obviously, I think it makes sense. Um, but I wonder if we can do something to trigger more content. Uh, if uh, we could uh, investigate different, uh, like now we know the overall, so to speak, of the different projects, but how about going into digging deeper, seeing what differentiates us deeply or how a certain feature works. But I, I don't know if it would be any interest, but just coming up with some random ideas there. Yeah, I like that. I think well, just in the general case, like I think we should probably maybe take the, this we could take this meeting or queue it up more officially for the next time to like actually take time brainstorming. Sort of, I guess two things. One is sort of the white paper. What what are what are where we want this to head, and then two meeting topics mm -hmm. and agenda topics for kind of the the future, knowing full well that we might scramble those for if if we come up with kind of better things. Um, I also think we could use one of these meetings as almost like a white paper working session. I know for me, it's hard to carve out time and sometimes having a meeting scheduled just to have the time blocked off can be super, super valuable. Um, so I think we could also potentially do that. Uh, as far as the going down to once a month, I think that also makes sense, especially until we get kind of a, you know, looking out a couple of, a couple of meetings worth of agenda. Like if we have no agenda, it seems silly to to all get together every other week. Yeah, that makes sense too. Um, yeah, maybe we should have talked about the white paper first, and then. The, um, yeah, that, that it, that's a really good point. Is that we could use this time to dive into the different sections of what we're going to talk about in the white paper, or even. Um, think about things that maybe don't work in the intro white paper, but might be good topics that we could do as as follow on things, like more white papers. Or I'd lo love to see us do like blog posts or something like that to get more content out there. Um, okay, yeah, so be cool. so maybe we'll not make any official changes yet, but um, I guess maybe just just make the statement that it's possible the next meeting of this month we may want to skip um, unless we actually do get into uh, more working on some of the, the, the white paper topics or something else comes up. Um, yeah, and, and feel free at any point if, if someone has something that they want to dig into that great, propose that as an agenda topic and, and you know, <laughs> it shouldn't be a problem to fit that in. Yeah. Another thing maybe worth mentioning, I don't know how it is for you guys in the US, but generally here in Europe, summer means meetups uh, really don't happen. <laughs> so I, I, I guess point. it might be the same for online meetings. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's 
especially later in the summer. Yeah, especially later. Yeah, I know I'm going to wind up missing things for various trips and things like that along the way. Uh, I don't know if I'm missing one of these or not. I haven't looked. But yeah, I think that's, that's also a good point that maybe at, at the very least we relax it for the summer <clears throat> and then see about collecting, getting a backlog of, of topics for once people are kind of back in full force in the fall. So that's a, uh, I'd buy that as a, as a good path too. Yeah, yeah. So I would say we have two pot potential tracks. One would be the white paper. The other one would be coming up with other things that each of the members could present related to their own uh, OSs. So maybe two different people can kind of uh, follow up on these or something like that. And, and then we see if there is enough content to, to put stuff on the agenda. I'm happy to follow up with the one about the uh, topics for the OSs and yeah. Okay, great. Cool. Yeah, I think the, the white paper one is more like we could put it on the agenda and that's just what it will be. Um, and people can, we can send it out in the, in the working group Slack and, and then people know that that's the plan and, and we can just sort of see how that goes and do more than one or or just say, well, that <laughs> either either we did it all and it's done, or that didn't go well. We don't need to do any more. Or hmm, that was great. We should probably do another couple of those. I, I think like there's not a whole lot for that second one. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm I'm happy to write that down on the agenda for for next time. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. Um, well, then I think we could go into that next topic. Um, of the white paper. <laughs> um, you know, a couple comments on there. Thanks, Victor, for taking a look at that. Uh, yes, if, if anyone has like a strong interest of any of these sections where they feel like writing some stuff up, that um, I think it's kind of just open free for all right now. It's like we just need some content to start getting put together and. I think it's perfectly fine to write a bunch of stuff, you know, get some stuff written down and then we can rehash it later. Or, you know, maybe something doesn't quite fit in what, in what we end up with and, and, you know, we can either reuse that content somewhere else, or it just helps other people, you know, think about some of the things that they do want to talk about and what we would want to include in this. I put a, one, one comment at the bottom of it, and I'm not an uh, expert in this area at all. I'm just learning. So um, yeah, can you uh, maybe see what, what uh, your response to the, my comment at the bottom of the document? Yeah. I think for the most part, um other than than like um uh what's what's Philip's um other than Unicraft, I think we we're we're all based on Linux, so that kind of covers a lot of that hardware part. So, so mostly in the past, his uh, special OS means uh, has kind of slimmed down or more secure. Um, uh, so it's all one hardware is already there. And that's usually that's what happens. So um, nowadays, there seems to be a, a lot of trend to custom hardware um, because there is open source hardware now. So I just wonder, just um, uh, is there any, um, like on the OS side, if you want to do something, is there anything that, Need to have on the hardware side for the special OS to do to, to support certain feature. Yeah, I, I I think for the most part it's just having available Linux drivers for most of us. Um, I'm not sure how Unicraft does if they do anything specific for specialized hardware or, or different kind of unique hardware? 
they are um, there's a lot of so-called hardware software co-design mostly it's on the algorithm side like especially i mean in the past there's some like java um a static and then nowadays probably it's more like ai algorithm how to um map the algorithm to the proper hardware configuration so i, I yeah for the operating system i wonder if there are similar um opportunities to uh, kind of co-design i'm not aware of any uh, because it's from, usually that's kind of above where most of us operate um but that, that might be a good thing to start a thread in the in our slack channel um, see if anybody does have anything. I would be interested to see what Unicraft does if they do anything special, especially for like AI accelerators, things like that. I think that that's uh, uh, that'd be great. Yeah, but that may be something for like. No, maybe in like the limitations section of the white paper, if there are certain restrictions, we could mention that there. So that, that'd be good to know, but it'd be a good topic to bring up. Yeah, I think to the, your point earlier, Sean, like one of the one of the reasons why we collectively can build these OSs without giant, like single purpose companies, like there are clearly giant companies backing these things, but generally with a very small team that's actually doing the, the building of the operating system, the reason why that's even at all feasible is is thanks to the massive amount of effort that goes into the Linux kernel and, and having really, really broad hardware support. And every now and then we run into new hardware platforms or tools or reasons. So like right, NVIDIA drivers were the were the one from from history and more recently it's things like Mellanox for all the big AI use cases that now NVIDIA owns. And um, so that like there are there are times where you have to reach outside the kernel, but often but it, it's rare in in my experience when when we're uh, when we're talking about being based on the Linux kernel. We we just we gain so much from that thing that that uh, the, the I, I guess for for folks like Maru and for other kind of edge people as well as I guess my line between edge and embedded starts to blur uh, and then out towards Unicraft like I think there is probably conversations to have there around uh, around some of that co design and and unique hardware architectures and stuff like that. But certainly from like where I sit and looking at kind of the, the container focused operating systems that generally are like built to operate in the cloud, uh, they all often, often they're built on, on to, to run on, on custom hardware because all the big cloud vendors are building their own ARM chips and things now, um, but it's still like an ARM architecture that doesn't require you know, massive co-design or, or big changes within the kernel. Most of my understanding is when it comes to new hardware, it's usually um, the, the kernel, there's different Linux kernel need to certify their, you know, develop their drivers, whether it's Debian, Fedora, uh, you know, those, those guys, Suzy and all that. So um, it, it's all the special OS, it, it, are they, are this special OS all, all depend on the one of this major distribution or is a uh, independent uh, kernel sort of? I think that's a bit so, of everything. Yeah. yeah. For the most part, other than like Sean was pointing out, Unicraft, I think they're pretty much all based on Linux and where they're not, like as in, as in the, the Linux kernel and where they're not, they're based on kind of another fairly large upstream kernel like, like OpenBSD, FreeBSD, something like that. Um, as far as like the distro that they're based on, that's kind of all over the place. Cos is sort of Gen two based, but mostly leverages some Gen two semantics, and we have multiple upstream package sources, including kind of the canonical upstream where we look to like GitHub for various packages or things like that. Um, Bottle Rocket has no shared lineage other than they pull the the Amazon Linux kernel. It's a completely novel build system that happens to use RPM packaging under the covers, but barely, <laughs> mostly for the declarative semantics. Like it's like the, the RPM choice in Bottle Rocket is like choosing to use a make file. It's like, 
this does nice things for me. It sounds like a good choice and I know how to use it. Uh, and that was, that was why RPMs were, were used for bottle rocking. So I, um, and then, and then others are, are much more truly kind of based on and derived from a, a larger operating system. Yeah. Also for edge devices in our case, even the weirdest, uh, uh, cases that we've had, uh, for the most part, the Linux, uh, kernel already has drivers for them. Uh, the complications come from that each, uh, device maker has different ways of doing the booting. And sometimes it's not very clear how it works, but, uh, yeah, either you have to figure out with them directly or trial and error kind of situation. And in the worst case scenario, what has worked with us is some sort of a chain loading mechanism. So uh, start with whatever feature they offer you to try to get Grub or EFI bootloader. And then from there, you can do whatever your own OS is already doing and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, I, I would say mo most cases are covered once you're based on, on Linux, unless you're doing some custom hardware, I don't know. <laughs> Actually, my question is, because there's a lot of custom hardware going forward, it's gonna be more uh, CPU, DPU, and you know, of course, GPU, uh, MPU, LPU, I guess all, all kinds of different combinations of hardware uh, customized. Mm -hmm. So does that lead to any need for some special OS features that's not in the you know, big distributions? I, uh, not in our case, at least. Carus Car hasn't had that problem. Uh, what we try to tackle the most is uh, you are doing all this hardware that very custom made and you don't want to also make the OS uh, and, and figure out how to do all the maintenance of the OS and upgrades and all of that. So you go to a distribution like Kairos, the, which already has been tested in many other uh, devices and, and offers you kind of a framework on how to do already the immutability, the uh, upgrades, uh, I don't know, secure boot, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know, maybe if you're going into the router spectrum or something like that, where you really only need certain things of the operating, si uh, operating system working, right? Maybe you don't even need users or whatever. <laughs> um, maybe in that case, you really would need uh, uh, special special operating system if we could call it like that. I don't know. Yeah, I, I guess I, I think most of your question, Victor, is around it was around hardware, but but it kind of tickled something else that I figured I might as well point out. Um, one of the things that like I think we see across the <clears throat> like across the tech industry is one reuse of stuff when it's good, and two kind of some amount of hubris that my small team can build a better fill in the blank than the five different options that exist up there already, right? Um, whether that's, oh, I can build a, a better init system than sysvnit or systemd, or or I can build a better isolation tool than than se linux or app armor, or 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 right. Um, and and so from like in the in the from a software perspective, sometimes we wind up building something novel, but for the most part, I think like building these big key components requires a pretty big effort and there's already big efforts afoot. And so you, the only time you really wind up kind of trying to reinvent the wheel is when like um, a torture metaphor, but like is when the wheel is not going to fit on the car. And so, so like, again, just like with the Linux kernel, like we lean heavily on these other big projects uh, for, for a lot of the value that they already provide and a lot of the ongoing support and security guarantees that they provide, right? There's something to be said for having lots of eyes on a project um, to help keep it secure, right? The increasing use of Linux in the past, whatever, 20 years has done wonders for the Linux kernel security posture um, because way more people are looking at it. 
and and if you go and and build your own thing it may have security holes that, that no one's looking at or looking for or if they've found they might not be telling you about um, and same goes for for all the user space stuff yeah thanks Right. Well, to, to get some things going with the, the white paper, um, the one thing I was going to ask is, um, you know, we're, we're, we're at least going to kind of cover everyone, all the projects that are involved in this working group, you know, just at least to highlight them a little bit. Um, so I think what, what could be a, just a good, easy thing to get some people going with this is if we could ask someone from each project to, to write like a, just like a three to five sentence um, summary, maybe of your project, because uh, then I think we can include that in this white paper. Of, you know, we, we'll have an overview, probably a little graphic. I know during our talk in Paris, we talked kind of the spectrum of you know the Unicraft end to a more full featured, um, well, not full featured. I shouldn't say it that way, but you know, a, a, a larger. Um, more towards the general purpose side, uh, uh, distro, um, so that there, you know, there's kind of these different choices that so so someone coming into this and they're looking at what OS should I use? I know I wanted, I don't want a general purpose distro. I want something a little more specialized, but you know, there's still some some range within that specialization. Um, so I think we we could have like a a graphic if we can represent that some way show the different projects and just kind of roughly where they they are on that spectrum. Um, um, and then have this, you know, th these brief, very brief overviews of, you know, this is what Google Container OS is. This is what Bottle Rocket is. This is what Kairos is. This is what Talos is. Um, so they, they get an idea. And then if it is, if there's something interesting in that, that quick summary, then they know, okay, this is something you know, maybe I want to look at, at Kairos a little closer because it sounds like maybe that's me that addresses my use case. Um, so I think that would be a good good start, you know, for something if we can at least capture that. Um, so I guess that's kind of my my ask of action items for people is someone from each project, if you could just come up with a few sentences that you think is a good summary, good overview of your project. Um, and then we'll figure out where that fits in with the final doc. Yeah, it makes sense. That's a great idea, actually. And maybe a lot of the bullet points that were already put uh, can also be shared from each project a bit summarized. Like, how, what, uh, instead of how do I choose an OS, like, why would I choose Kairos in this case? Or why would I choose mm -hmm. this other one? I don't know if you guys have seen it, but uh, there there are these books uh, from the Pragmatic Bookshelf, I think it is, mm -hmm. uh, called uh, I don't know Seven Databases in Seven Days or something like that. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could have that kind of approach where basically uh, they they are just sharing a little bit about uh, the nuances, uh, so to speak, of of each of those databases. But in our case of this special purpose OS. That could be cool, I think. Also, I remember that uh, we used to have a, a guy um, doing, uh, I forget the, the term of that role, but I don't know, something like evangelism for the company or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, he did uh, in the new stack, I'm going to share uh, this uh, article about uh, alternative uh, choosing a container OS for edge Kubernetes. It's obviously biased towards us, I would say. Uh, so I'm, I'm not suggesting that we should follow that exactly. But what I'm saying is that uh, maybe we could try to come up with something like that, but on bias, right? Or, or like each piece biased on their own. But since there are so many biases, then it's kind of unbiased. I don't know. Uh, but if, uh, 
if it helps, it's there on the chat. Yeah, this is great. I, I vaguely remember reading this before, but this is perfect. Oh, um, more of a, because I, I just don't know this you know, from a bigger picture perspective. So core OS and, and WebAssembly, one thing both seems to be common is considered kind of a quite innovative in a way. Like if you describe like uh, to a, like a, just like someone like me who doesn't know either, you know, details, um, how do you describe the why it's innovative core OS and uh, WebAssembly? Can you say that again? If, if someone, I just I mean, you pose this question. So um, core OS and WebAssembly to me all sounds like pretty innovative in a lot of ways. I read that before, but I guess I forgot a lot of the details. But how, how do you, um, based on the history of core OS and WebAssembly, uh, what do you think is the most innovative part of uh, how, how, it, you know, how it was invented or developed? For example, oh, to me, WebAssembly is is sort of um, is innovative because it's kind of a break the abstraction layer, right? So that's uh, that's my my understanding of uh, the how how is it innovative. Um, yeah, I no longer consider the same layers uh, of uh, um, that. That's why it's innovative. Um, yeah. What, what about CoreOS and I think when CoreOS came out, the, the main innovation was that was the first one that that was kind of following this pattern that we are that most of us are of. Hey, we Linux distros have a lot of things that you don't necessarily need if you're running containers. But what if we get rid of all that extra stuff and just take what we need just to do the job? And so I think they were the the big one that really started the paradigm that most of us kind of follow of you know specialize a Linux distro to just do what you needed to do and, and get rid of all the extra stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, that's not, a very not good quite point. as innovative as WebAssembly, uh, you know, like changing paradigms, but um, yeah. more of an evolution, yeah. I think, of, uh, of Linux distros. And, um, you know, first it was just getting a Linux distro together that people could use. And, and now it's, there's more focus on what can you do with the Linux system or, or how can you specialize the Linux distro just for what you need. I also, if I remember correctly, when Docker containers were out, uh, one of their biggest criticism was that because you were sharing so much between them, uh, security wise could be a bit of a mess. And uh, I think uh, that was also part of the kind of problems that CoreOS tried to solve. Like, okay, then let's provide an operating system that doesn't bring all the generalized uh, tools that you normally would have, because then you also reduce where you can uh, get an, an attack and, and focus it on, on running containers there, kind of. Um, I don't know. I personally don't know much about uh, WebAssembly, but to some degree, I see all these uh, approaches, uh, even, I don't know, the Java virtual machine, all of these things as uh, ways of running 
uh, abstracting a certain layer, right? Like you want to make it as easy as possible uh, to run your code. That can mean different things, right? In the case of WebAssembly, I guess, come with whatever is your already existing programming language. In the case of Java, it's like uh, always write the same language. Um, in the case of container, um, focus OS is uh, uh, whatever your container is, bring it, right? That, that is kind of like bringing this generalization so that some people can focus on the upper layer of that abstraction and some people can focus on the underneath layer of that abstraction, I would say. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So um, so it sounds like the core OS is basically um, the first mover when it comes to uh, instead of adding features, trying to slim it down to meet certain requirement. That that seems to be the, the... They did add a lot of features because they were the ones who came up with etcd and stuff like this. So it, it was, uh, once you start, uh, I don't know, tackling those problems, you also start realizing, hey, wait, uh, the current model of the Linux OS will not uh, work well here. So we need a different kind of solution for that. Um, but at the same time, you can see um, Kubernetes distributions like uh, K3S who go back in time and say, no, let's not put that CD because that's too heavy and you might not need all that much. So uh, um, yeah, I, I guess it is one of those situations where you, uh, uh, grow and, and, and uh, sorry, I, I don't get the term in English right now, but you know, like you, you, you shrink and you, and you stretch, you shrink and you stretch depending on what you need in, in each uh, scenario and, and the different, uh, uh, special purpose OSs have, uh, that, that's why they also have different focus in this case, I would say. Yeah. So, okay. It's cool. Um, I think it'd be interesting to kind of study the history a little bit. That'd be interesting. Uh, one one thing I I did ask um Luke Wagner, the the creator of uh, um the uh, uh WebAssembly, he's one of the co uh inventor, I don't know, the inventor or creator, um about how what, what's being done, uh, like what's the theoretical basis for what they're thinking to make the abstraction. And he mentioned type theory. Uh, originally, I thought it was mathematical wise, you know, category theory might be something to you can, you know, group, um, you know, really because they're they're talking about how to group the different concepts to make abstraction, right? So, but he mentioned type theory um, to try to understand what what he meant by that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it'd be interesting to um, really, I guess, understand the what kind of a thinking process that went into the the, the creation of you know the the core OS and and what could be the could be the way to think or you know logically to what was the next evolution of special OS. Uh, that's a cool topic. Uh, where 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 are we now and where things are going in the future? <laughs> That's cool. Uh, I don't know, but that would make sense to at least touch a little bit on it on the white paper if we could. Yeah, I think that might be that also would be kind of a fun topic, like as a just a hey everybody, let's let's chat about where <laughs> where where we think things are headed. I, I personally think that it might be it might be very cool. I don't know that this is actually where things are headed, but I think there's the possibility to, to go in this direction to start to have. Um, sort of like I'm gonna like on-demand operating systems, as in I choose from a menu of of things that people are maintaining, and and I get you know just the set that I want. So like right uh, in in my production systems, I don't actually want any debugging tools installed, but in my test systems, I want the exact yeah something sort of like the way Nix operates. You could something sort of like the way Gentoo operates technically, um, but more curated than either, right? Like I want the containerd stack. Give me, and you get all the containerd stack and its dependencies, um, and potentially some richness there that is like also, you know, uh, because 
were deploying to Kubernetes, you get some CNI pre-installed or what, like, right? Um, I think I think that 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 would be a neat place to get to. Uh, certainly, costs we have cost has four hundred ish packages, and and for some people, those four hundred packages are super important, and for others, they're not. But once you have them all out there, it's very challenging to understand how people are using them and which ones you maybe can take away or or need to keep or need to keep stable versus versus can move to the latest version and. Um, I know some of our internal customers uh, at, at GCE would would quite happily curate their own kind of cost variant, um, it, it, so long as we provided the the like patching and packaging of of the software. Kind of let's let's the distro become the do its key work as the distro, which is keeping packages stable and secure, and let's other people choose. The, the composition of the distro. So it's leaning a little bit into like a more traditional full-fledged Linux distribution where you have packages and you can install additional ones, but it would still be only a build time. I think there's all sorts of interesting things in that direction. Um, certainly in the cloud let, where we start to let customers, savvy customers, either internal or external do, do more, have more choice um, yet retain kind of all the minimalism and guarantees around security that these purpose-built distros provide. Um, to some extent, that's like taking a step towards Unicraft, but but not with the kernel so much. But we right, we can we can add and remove modules real easy and get a slimmer and slimmer kernel for people. But certainly not a Unicurl. That's that's hard. You need PhDs for that, I think. <laughs> That's funny that you mentioned that. Uh, if I remember correctly, um, CoreOS, uh, one one of the founders used to work at SUSE, and uh, I think the idea wasn't uh, of creating a CoreOS wasn't uh, very interesting for the company at that point. <laughs> and uh, but. At the same time, they had another project called the SUSE Studio, where you could pretty much uh, mix and match what you wanted, and the output would be uh, your OS. But but the focus was still mostly on the user, like oh, do I want to have an office, uh, um, you know, like a spreadsheet and, and this kind of uh, tools? Do I want to have? Uh, uh, GIMP installed and not so much uh, at, uh, uh, I would say, at, uh, looking at the full stack as in, oh yeah, I only want this part of the kernel. I only want these modules. Uh, I, I don't need user space for this particular uh, OS and stuff like that. Uh, it would be funny if we go back to, to something like that, but now focused on, on the tools we're running and not the people who are using that uh, OS. I see Sean put Nix. Yeah, Nix is an interesting one. I haven't investigated more much about it, but it looks uh, uh, early, like early on when when Bottle Rocket wasn't yet called Bottle Rocket and wasn't yet released. Uh, we had a build system, but we didn't love the build system. It but it was functional, and uh, one of the guys on the team knows new, <laughs> I mean, he still does, but he's not on the team anymore, uh, Nix real well and actually like took a couple weeks and wrote a, a bottle rocket build system that was Nix based. It was, it was pretty slick. Um, nice. The consensus was no one else knows how Nix works and it seems hard. <laughs> uh, and, and we did know how make worked uh, and cargo <laughs> and, and that seemed less hard. I don't know that it actually uh, turned out to be less hard, but it, at the time, uh, for 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 him, uh, who the guy who built it, it it was like awesome, and, and he did it pretty quickly, and and um, it made perfect sense to him. It didn't. It was very very confusing for the rest of us. That's not a not a knock on Nix. That's a knock on like my cognitive ability to understand Nix. By the way, <laughs> that's cool. I didn't know that. <laughs> uh, it's probably still around somewhere uh, in a in a PR internally. Yeah, but that, that's an interesting uh, topic also to talk about, like uh, why certain things pick up and others not so much. I don't know, maybe. Nick, I know that Nix is uh, quite popular, but not at the Docker uh, level kind of popularity. 
Um, and, and there were other tools like this, right? Like, uh, L, uh, what is it? L, LSF containers? I don't remember their name right now. Uh, L, LXE containers, LXE containers. Uh, which at least when I was starting to play with uh, Docker, uh, made quite some sense. Uh, it, it was a nice tool to use, um, but it, it didn't take over at all. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, there's there's history from before Docker and kind of the notion of a Linux container in, in like Solaris jails and things like that. Oh yeah, but that's true. There's been various things that look like this and it's not like Docker invented some super novel piece of isolation technology. They invented some very nice UI to encapsulate like existing Linux technologies, which mm -hmm. I also find really interesting, right? Like usually the way we think about these things is like some big technological innovation and Docker was, it was technological innovation, but like really it was a very nice packaging format for interacting with uh, like, you know, distinct file systems and all the niceties that, that the Linux community had already built. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, yeah, I think you're, you're right. Uh, for example, the Docker file is one of the things that almost everyone I talk to seems to like. Um, it, it, uh, as long as you don't have to maintain a big one, <laughs> then it's really a pain. <laughs> Well, and with the multi-stage builds and and things like that, and I, I think they've they've actually helped a lot there too. Where the, those big complex ones at least are separated into chunks, you can kind of reason yeah. about them a little better. Mm -hmm. um, the the I think the, the Docker file format is is really neat because it is this wonderfully declarative, fairly simple. Like, there's not that many kind of. Uh, uh, I'm gonna say verbs, but they're not verbs. Not all of them. Um, to the, the, you know, the, and then you get to write whatever you want after them. Like it, it's pretty simple, really, um, but it's incredibly flexible and lets you do a lot in a way that that's like pretty easy to understand on at least on the surface level. It's it's a really impressive tool. Um, yeah. but, but it is interesting to think about kind of the things that have happened both before and after, and why one rather than the others gain traction. Like that would be a a whole body of research that would be very interesting. I'm going to go with sweet branding and metaphor. <laughs> Docker has a whole like containers on a whale thing. And, and that's that paints a pretty picture. Sweet graphic designer. <laughs> Just posted a link for the history of uh, Sherry. I think it's a, it's a um, Cambridge professor did a research. Originally, he focused on security. And concluded that security, what he wants to achieve, is not achievable without the hardware change. <laughs> um, yeah, so I was wondering, is there anything that's similar? Like it's, it's just on the operating system side, there's just nothing can be achieved for that feature, whether it's security or performance. It has to go to the um, the hardware layer. Nice. Let me check it out. We're 48 minutes into the hour. Um, anything else we should cover today? Nothing for me. I'm impressed that we filled the time. I thought we were yeah. going to be here for four minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're going to have a really... Thank you for asking all your questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Every time I think we're going to have a really short meeting, it ends up being like a long discussion. So that's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. Well, I think we can call there then. Um, you know, just I'd ask again if each project, if you could think about a few sentences to summarize what the project does. Um, any other ideas? Any, you know, the, the, this document is open. Feel free to jump in and, and add content, add ideas, change structure, whatever. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll make a little more progress on that soon. <laughs> All right. Nice. Well, thanks, everyone. Great to see you guys. Yeah, you too. And uh, see you in a couple of weeks. Yep. Have a good one.